Yeah, it's technical. That's what I'm not happy with. He's there, there, and he's a projector, and I don't want him to be there. I mean, he seems to be on. I mean, on. Is he? I mean, we've been here 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Now it's recording. Okay. Uh, fine. Okay. I will wait uh, just one second until this is distributed so that we have a little bit more quiet. Okay. Okay, can I ask you now to put the, those cards a little bit aside? Don't open them, don't play with them, don't make a noise with them. You will have a lot of uh, pleasure with them later. So what I'm going to uh, tell you is, uh, so what we are going to cover in this uh, module are general machine learning methodologies that are applied on uh, uh, large uh, data collection. Okay. Uh, we are going to cover things that are uh, displayed here, regression, classification, uh, feature dimensionality, uh, dimensionality reduction, uh, selection of uh, uh, dimensions, clustering, anomaly detection, association mining, and some practical considerations on how to design or how to apply those things in practice. Okay. Uh, is there anybody in this uh, class that has seen and knows what all of those things are? Okay, so there is one person that uh, knows most of them, but uh, the rest of you will learn something uh, during uh, the, uh, in, uh, this semester. Uh, fine, so there are 
Okay, this is quite important now. There is the assessment. The assessment is in the final exam 70%. That counts as a normal exam. And there are five lab assignments. In total, they count for 30% of the mark. So each lab session, each, sorry, each assignment, each assignment counts for 6%. Okay. There are now 11 weeks. 11 lab sessions. Okay. The first lab session is an introduction. The rest, 10 of them, are take care of the five assignments. So we have two, assign, two, two labs per assignment. OK? Is that clear? OK, good. Uh, during those two weeks, so two lab sessions, you are going to get assistance from the demonstrators so that who will help you to do the assignments, OK? What you need to do is download the uh, assignment uh, description and compile a document. That document, you need to submit it in a PDF format. That document will contain your answers to the questions that have been asked. If you need to put descriptive code inside that document, put it there. You need to explain things that in, the, in, the, in that document, OK? Not just give a yes, no answer, or uh, uh, very, very, very short. Is it understandable? OK. A good practice is to compile this document throughout the two weeks, OK? And ask the TAs to give you some feedback on your, the answers that you compile while, you, uh, while you're building the document. Is it understandable? OK? They will not tell you what the answer is, but they are instructed to help you understand the level at which of detail, for example, in which you need to answer the question, if you are answering the right question, if you understood the question, things like that. Is it clear? Right. Good. There are postgraduate and undergraduates. And because there are too many of you, the lab sessions are split. The undergraduates have on Friday from 1 to 1, uh, from 2.45, so just before the lectures. OK? And the postgraduate, they have it on Monday from 4 to 6. OK? Uh, hmm? Yeah, I OK. The deadlines for both of you are the same, are the next Monday. So you have two weeks in which you get assistance, OK? And then the next Monday, the Monday after that, 9 o'clock, there is a deadline. You need 9 o'clock in the morning, OK? You need to submit. Is that clear? OK. So for the postgraduates that have the, uh, uh, that have the, that the, that they have the lab on uh, Monday, OK, uh, they, well, they get assistance or they get to catch up quite quickly. The undergraduates that start the first lab on Friday, a good practice for them would be to download the lab sheet on Monday and then start doing it already uh, so that when Friday comes and they go to the lab that they are ready with the questions that they have to the uh, demonstrators. Is that right? I mean, it's, is that clear? OK, good. Um, fine. We have several demonstrators. Some of them are uh, yeah, for undergraduate. Uh, other ones are for postgraduate. We have a senior demonstrator who is Ricardo. OK. And uh, uh, if something happens uh, with the labs, the first, the first, first you contact the demonstrators. Then if that doesn't help, the uh, senior uh, demonstrator. And then, uh, and then us. Uh, no, OK. 
as both of us. Okay. Uh, is that clear? Was that? Okay. Fine. Uh, there is a lot of material that it is uploaded in QM class, and it is not only just the lecture slides. There are a lot of notes. There, are, there is additional material. And if you want to read the book, I think a book actually that it is more uh, um, supporting the uh, module, is this the data mining book uh, of um, um, so, uh, Practical Machine Learning Tools and Techniques from uh, Witt and Frank and uh, Hall, etc. Okay. Uh, fine, I don't think that I had anything else to say. There are some basic rules. Bring pen and paper to take notes. Put your phones on silence and in your bags. Don't talk with each other and all the things that you should that you know already. I think that uh, that was it. Have I missed yeah. anything? Or? I'm going to... Then that was all for me. You're going to see me in... Uh, um, from, uh, five weeks. In five weeks. So don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're in good hands. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you again. Right. See you later. Right. So, um, apologies for those of you who haven't managed to get a card. I'll try to sort it out by by next week. Apparently, the yellow is the. For some of you, is your favorite color because um, now you have them. You are the one. Okay, so um, who needs cards? There, there, there. A few of you, right? So keep one of each color, and if you can, just send them to the back of the classroom. So why am I giving you these very nice plasticky cards? Right, you. This classroom has a capacity of 200 students, right? And I cannot be asking each one of you. Uh, individually a question so what we are going to do is something a little bit different now and then I will have a slide with uh, a question with three possible answers right and those answers will be color coded so they will be red blue yellow so instead of asking your question and then no one is saying anything and so on all of you you will have to participate and answer with, with what you think is the right answer right so you do it by raising whichever color you think is right okay let we, let's practice this just once, and then we'll move into into, uh, into the actual contents of this course. So do you know how to use the, the color cards? All right? Very good. OK. There is always a 5% of the classroom who chooses a color different from blue, because it's a bit funny. So I was expecting that already. So you know how to use them, right? So um, keep them because they are very heavy. Uh, you can return them at the end of the, in December, whenever it's the last, uh, the, the last lecture. But from, from the time we make sure that you bring them every Friday to the classroom because we will try to use them, okay? Right, so I think that's it. Every, everything I, I wanted to say. And we are going to start... Uh, We are going to start. Right, so since you are quite a few people here, another thing that we will try to do is the, the following. Well, I'll be speaking for, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. Then I will stop. I will walk around. I will try to collect a few questions from those of you who might have any. And then I will come back here, and I will answer for the whole classroom. OK? So we'll try to do it like that so that um, everyone has, a, has uh, the chance to ask questions. Usually, it's the first row who is always willing to, to participate, but you might have questions at the back of the classroom. The undergrad, I think all of you are there, right? And here are the postgrad. So uh, every half an hour, sometimes it would be 40 minutes, but I will try to stop and walk around the classroom. And you are more than welcome to ask me questions. You can talk to each other and so on, right? But very importantly, please have a pen and a paper in front of you, right? Be ready. The slides are not a contract. Okay, so if you think that just by reading the slides you're covering all the material that we are going to study, you are mistaken. Okay, the slides are for me to present the material. We give you the slides because we are, when the basic cognitive process is associating what 
we see in the slides with the concepts we were discussing and so on. So we know that it's important for you to have them, but don't, don't use them as your actual learning, exclusive learning material, okay? Read some of the materials, the book, and so on. Right. So we are going to obviously start today by discussing what we mean by data mining, okay? Which is a very, very suggestive name, right? So data mining, if you go online and you uh, search for data mining, you will get many different answers. But I think that the best definition is uh, talking of data mining as the art of extracting knowledge from, from data, right? It's like an art. We have data, we extract knowledge. Now, when we say data mining, I think we are implicitly assuming a few other things which are not in this definition. For a start, we're assuming that there is a lot of data. Right? When you're doing data mining, you have a, uh, a mountain, and then you go there in the mountain, and somewhere is something of value. So this is the second aspect of data mining. We are uh, clearly sending the message that knowledge has some value, right? or a lot of value. And obviously, you know this, because otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be starting at all. Right? So you come here to study a degree because you understand that by learning something, your value, so to speak, is going to, to increase. Right? So we have the word data, we have the word knowledge, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But maybe we need to talk a little bit more about what we mean by data and uh, how do we sort of materialize, how do we see the knowledge. Right? Knowledge is, seems to be describing something intangible, but we are going to try to make it tangible. So, first of all, data. Data is anything that can be, or that has been, sorry, recorded. Okay? Anything. 30 year, years ago, we would talk about analog and digital recording media, right? But nowadays, everything is going to be digital, right? But in principle, data is anything that has been recorded. And you will be reading, or you, you will see that very often we don't talk about data, we talk about data sets, right? Which is, let's say, a subset of all the data that we can, uh, that we can uh, gain access to, right? So when we talk about data set, we talk about collection of items, right? Which we call instances. <coughs> For instance, here could be recording the weight and the height of each one of you, right? So the attributes would be two numbers per instance, and you would be creating one instance in our data set, right? So we would have more or less roughly 200 <coughs> instances, and each one of the instances would have two numbers, right? So that's a data set. It's a collection of instances, and each instance has a set of attributes, okay? Now, what is knowledge? And this is the, the thing that, I mean, I don't know if you have thoughts in the past about the meaning of knowledge or what knowledge is or how can knowledge be valuable, but knowledge can be a statement, right? So a statement is a sentence that can be true or false. That's a statement. It can be a narrative. It can be an explanation, a description of something, right? Or it can be a mathematical or a computer model, okay? In this course, we are going to be focusing on knowledge as a model. Okay, so when we say data mining is the art of extracting knowledge from data, this is going to be translated into data mining is the art of creating a model. We will talk about models in a, in a, in a, in a little bit. Model from data, right? So we have data, we have a data set, and by looking and anal analyzing the data set, we are going to create a model, right? So the, the word model is going to come back to haunt us continuously, right? So data mining, as you can imagine, uses tools and techniques from data sites, okay? So you can say that data mining is one of the activities that is supported by data, data science, okay? Right, so probably you will have searched for data science and you, you have found 
words such as machine learning, data mining. Many of you might already be familiar with many of the terms that I'm showing in this screen, right? But I assume that many of you will still be confused, right? So when you read all the, those terms, in your head you really have this. So you have a collection of terms related to data science which make really no sense at all, right? Or you don't know how they relate to each other. Why do I talk about Hadoop and AWS, NLP? What is, are they the same thing? Are they different things? Do they belong to the same category of what? Okay. So one of the purpose of uh, this uh, course is to help you to create order from this soup of terms. Okay, so we are going to be discussing many of the terms that we have here, but obviously not all of them. Those of you that are studying big data science, you might be studying about Hadoop, Spark, NoSQL, and so on. Others will be studying artificial intelligence, so you will be focusing on other terms and so on. But the idea is that you, at the end of this course, you, at least you will be able to distinguish all these terms. And something that I would suggest you do is you go to Total Jobs or Jobs, blah, blah, blah. Look for, uh, look for several jobs which uh, look for a data scientist. Get the text there, okay? And then go and search for one of those online tools that allow you to create this, uh, I think it's called Word Cloud, from text, right? I think it's very sort of interesting to do that because you will see which terms those job descriptions uh, mention more frequently, right? So if you go to several uh, job sites and look for data scientists, senior data scientists and so on, get the text, the job description for each one of the jobs, you put them together, then you copy them and paste them into one of these online tools and look at the word cloud that you get. So if you see that AWS is this big, and you don't know what AWS is, you might want to check, right? Because at the end of the day, all of you have uh, some interest into data science, and professionally, you might want to do something related to data science, right? So look for those things that you don't know what they are, and if you, you don't know what they are, learn them, okay? Okay, so before, starting to talk a little, well, continually talk, talking about data um, mining, I wanted to stop a minute and discuss the, the two words data and science, right, and why they are together. And one thing I want to um, make you uh, think about is that, well, for a start, when we talk about data science, we might want to put the focus on science, right? And one thing that I want to clarify for all of you so that you sort of understand the importance of data is that science is not necessarily about very complicated machines or very sophisticated algorithms and so on. Science is just about uh, evaluating evidence, right? Evidence that something, that a statement is true or not. That's science. Science is not anything else but that, okay? So uh, as data scientists, we need also to be able to evaluate evidence. And we will discuss how to do this in the course. And then when we look at the word data, what we also need to understand is that data by itself is meaningless, okay? Data means nothing until we analyze it, until we give it some meaning, right? If I give you, for instance, a, as a very simple example, If I ask you, what is this, 1001? Some of you might be thinking that that's the decimal number nine, right? Or maybe you think that's 1001. Or if we had a few more bits, you could think that that's an ASCII character, right? If I ask you what this is, you need to say, I don't know, until we give that sequence of digits a meaning. We need to agree that we're talking about binary number, a decimal number, whatever you can imagine, right? So in data science, we are going to have collections of numbers. And they are just collections of numbers. Until we analyze them, until we give them meaning, they don't mean anything, right? There's, there's, there's nothing like when you listen to the radio and they say, data shows, no, data shows nothing. 
we show something. We say something about data. We analyze data and we arrive to a conclusion, but data by itself is nothing, right? It means nothing. And also I wanted to let you know that there is nothing like neutral data, mm -hmm. okay? When people say that data uh, proves something, no, we use data to support a statement, but data by itself is, is meaningless, right? Okay, so in relation to this, I mean, we could spend many hours talking about uh, data science and so on, but I think it's a good way of understanding all, all of these things I'm talking about just by watching this video. I don't know if you rec uh, recognize James Randi. I think he must be 90 or 100 already. Uh, but he, he, he's a magician, right? And uh, most of his life he has spent in trying to uh, debunk many um, pseudoscience, pseudoscience um, pseudotherapies, and other psychic phenomena and so on, okay? I don't know if you are familiar with the term dowsing. You know what dowsing is? Right, so there, there are some people that claim that they can walk around with uh, something like a stick, right? And they can detect that there is water. There is a movie which is about water divine, I don't know if you've watched it, right? And this is something that has been practiced all over the world, okay? This video exposes dowsing, this, this practice, okay? And it's very, very, in my opinion, it's very interesting because what he's saying there, when he's talking to those people that he's doing the experiments with, is that he doesn't want to understand the mechanism of dowsing, okay? He's saying, I'm not concerned about anything like that. What I want to know is whether dowsing really uh, is really true or not. Whether people have the ability, right? Because if you talk to some people that do that practice dowsing, they give you always the same answer. They say, well, what happens is that there is no machine on the world, but or science doesn't have, or scientists, they don't have a machine that can detect what I can detect with, the, with those sticks. So this is the answer. Sorry, but you cannot prove that I cannot do it because you don't have the right machine. And actually the answer is, yes, I have the right machine. You are the machine, right? Okay, so if, if you have studied the history of electromagnetism, for instance, or uh, electricity voltage and so on, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, they didn't have any, any multimeter or they couldn't measure voltages and so on, right? But they used people actually to understand better how uh, electrical currents worked. So for instance, if they, one of the experiments was to have a, a line of people holding hands and then they would close a circuit and they would see them how they jump and they would conclude that electricity can propagate, right? So that's a way of doing things with humans, right? So anyway, going back to this video, uh, what he does essentially is they go to a field, they bury 10 pipes or something like that and randomly they choose one which carries water and they ask the person that claims that can detect water with those sticks to let them know which of the pipes is carrying water. Then, I mean, they, they're not asking how you do it. They're asking, tell me which one carries water. And after that, they look at uh, how many of, in, um, they run many experiments and then they see that I think it's like 10% or 12% of them could tell which pipe was carrying water or 10% of the experiments were successful in the sense that in 10% or 12% of the experiments, they could tell which pipe carried water. And that's what we call random chance, right? So it's interesting that we are not here uh, using data to uh, explain this, but we are using data to assess whether dowsing really exists or not. So essentially the answer was like, no one, none of you, could detect water. And then they asked them, they said, do you still believe that you can detect water? And the answer was yes. All of them said yes. So you give them evidence and they say, I don't care about your evidence. I can do it, okay? So that's what I mean when I say that we need to be able to uh, analyze data scientifically, right? There is something called the scientific method and it tells us how to analyze data in a healthy way, okay? Right. 
I just le I left you a few books here in case, I don't know if you have read any of these, but if you are interested in science and uh, pseudoscience or, and all these topics, you can read these three books. I, I find them very, very interesting, okay? Right, any question? I don't think so, but any question? No? Right, so a few minutes ago we said that knowledge has value, right? As a scientist, you might believe that knowledge has value because you value knowledge somehow, right? But uh, this course, or uh, many of these courses uh, around data science, uh, in, in many of these courses we think that knowledge has value because we can then later create something that gives us money, right? So in data science, or in data mining specifically, the value, you see in this diagram you see two boxes. The top box is learner, and the bottom box is deployment, right? So in every data science project that we are going to discuss, there, there's going to be a first stage of creating a model, as we said, right? And then we deploy this model. And when we deploy this model, this is when we, so to speak, make money. Okay? That's where the value is going to, to be for us. So we are not going to take the, uh, the point of view of a scientist that just loves knowledge because of the sake of knowledge, right? Which is okay, and it's my case. We are going to adopt the point of view of a person that thinks that by gaining knowledge, by creating this model, then there's going to be some revenue coming from somewhere. Okay, so essentially this is, this, these are the two stages that we have to have in mind and that you need to understand when you try to, um, when you read in an article about some data science or AI technology around, okay? You need to be able to distinguish between the learner phase or stage where we use what we know from before plus the new data, plus some data, plus the data set, and we create a knowledge, and then the stage that we call deployment, which is when we are actually using this model that we have created. I have a few examples here, and by the way, other terms that we might use is inference or production, and so on, okay? So there are many, many different terms for, for this. So the first example, a search engine, Google. You go to Google, you write, you type data mining, and then at the top you have an ad. Okay, that's an example of an algorithm. So the deployment that I was talking about earlier essentially is a computer program that takes an input and produces an output, right? So here, this algorithm is taken as an input data mining and it's giving me an ad. Okay, clearly Google is interested in that, that you click on the first link because that link gives them money, right? So if you click on that link, this uh, mixpanel.com website is paying Google some money, right? So obviously Google is really interested in showing ads that we might be interested in, okay? So this is one example. Another example, this is uh, Amazon. So there are many e-commerce sites that will give you suggestions it's like you buy things, right? It's very interesting because you have, at the bottom you have coffee, and at the top you have uh, earplugs and uh, this sleeping mask and so on, right? So I don't know what the person was, probably was drinking too much coffee and then thinking, oh, I can't sleep because it's too noisy, <laughs> right? But anyway, those recommendations there, they are there because they think they are right for you and you're going to, to buy them, okay? That's another example of uh, knowledge, value, and so on. Another example, in banking, right? The, uh, the banks will tell you how much money you can borrow, but first you need to give them some little sum of you. So if they know that your salary is 100 pounds a month, that your debts are 6,000 pounds a month, and so on, they are going to say, sorry, but I'm not going to give you any money, right? So behind this, there is an algorithm that takes your data as an input and produces as an out output another piece of, another number, right, in this case. And 
you see, do I have many more examples? Yeah, I mean, it's one face recognition. Uh, and actually, I think we're not supposed to be taking pictures there, right? Anyway, this is an airport, and when you go through security, they just scan your face, and they realize, in my case, I always need to go to the guy there so that he can compare my passport with my face. But most of the time, this, this works fine, right? There's an algorithm, there's a computer vision program, checks your face, compares it against another face, and so on. And the last one is going to be spam field, right? Which I don't know how it, it works for you, but my Queen Mary account doesn't seem to have one, okay? But in principle, you should be able to detect which email is spam, which one isn't, okay? Based on, I don't know what. Anyway, we have here, as you can see, that uh, we can say that knowledge can bring value, right? You have some, some of the examples like um, self-driving car or the prices of flights and so on. Now, I said uh, in data mining, we have a first stage of creating a model, right? And we create this model by using what we knew from the past plus data. And once we create the model, we deploy it. What I have been discussing was not actually data science. I was just discussing a few uh, algorithms that take data as an input and produce an output, and by doing that, generate value. But they don't have to be, they might not be data mining algorithm, right? And let me explain myself. Let me go to the next here. So this is the slide that I showed you earlier, right? We have learned deployment. We have actually been discussing deployment, <laughs> but we have not discussing. We have not been discussing the top box, which is the learner box. And in this course, we are not going to be concerned too much about deployment. We are going to be talking about the learner, right? So all those examples that I showed you, they could be, they could have been algorithms that were implemented without using any data science technique. Okay? For instance, I mean, you can come up with many, many rules. So, um, okay. for instance, here, when, when can we say that the algorithm that Google uses to show this ad, when can we say this algorithm uses data science techniques? When can we say that? This is the question that we want to answer. I could have a very simple algorithm that says, just get whichever word has get the first word that has been typed and just show any ad that contains that word. That's a rule, right? That's an algorithm. But that's not a data science algorithm. Okay. So what I want you to distinguish is the deployment. Okay, so deployment assumes that our model has been already created, that our algorithm has already been implemented from the process of creating that algorithm. Process of creating the algorithm that can use data science techniques or not. But the deployment is something fixed. So when you listen to the news, they say this phone uses artificial intelligence. What do they mean by that? Do they mean that the phone is learning from you? Or do they mean that the phone has implemented an algorithm that has been created by using data science techniques? Right? This is the distinction you need to make, right? Between Creating the model, which is what we are concerned about, creating a model, and creating the model using data science techniques. That's what we want to do. The deployment, another person. We will just give them the model. This is a very good model and use it, okay? So we're not going to be talking about deployment. We are going to be talking about using data science techniques for creating models. And those models are the knowledge that we are extracting from data. I don't know if, have you ever heard about Kaggle? Yes? Good. Yeah. Blue meant, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so if you want to look at other examples, you can visit this website, which is kaggle.com, okay? There are many data science competitions there. So essentially, they formulate a problem, they give you a data set, and they ask you for a solution, okay? So you essentially give them a model, right? 
And as you can see, each one of those competitions has, well, not all of them, but many of them, they have a value in terms of a user benchmark by participating in these competitions. This is another example of creating or extracting knowledge produces a revenue, right, in this case for you. If you, are, if you have a look at it and you are very interested, excited, and so on about this, just come and talk to me and we can, I can help you and then we we'll split it, obviously. <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, it's 10 to 4, I think we can have here a 5 to 10 minutes break, okay, so we can start, we can resume the class in 10 minutes. I'm here, if you have any questions, you know where to find me, okay? Let's continue. So we, we've been talking about... Um, data mining, right? So reminder, data mining is the art of extracting knowledge we, which we are going to represent as a model from data. Okay, and data is anything that can be recorded and nowadays anything that can be recorded can be represented as a sequence of zeros and ones, right? So that a computer can crunch it and produce a calculation, okay? We have said that data mining can be seen as one of the many activities that, are, that belong to the field of data science. We have discussed a little bit what we mean about data science with the emphasis in, on science and data science with emphasis on data. Now we are going to start talking about um, different fields or maybe today is just going to be different terms that you will find in data science, right? So most likely you are already familiar with the terms that I'm showing on, on, on these slides, such as statistics, machine learning, image processing, signal processing, and so on, right? And as I said earlier, when I was discussing this uh, word cloud, one of the goals that we have here is that you manage to put each one of these terms in the right place, right? You know the role of each one of these technologies or techniques and so on, okay? At the top, you have statistics, and that's really, really important, okay? And um, let me here tell you all that mathematics are going to be very important in data mining, or data science in general. But I don't want you to think that by mathematics, I mean calculating the integral of this function. I'm not talking about those maths. I'm talking about maths as um, the ability of reading maths understanding what an equation means. I don't want you to necessarily to solve anything, right? Especially if those equations have already been solved, right? What is the point? But I want you to be able to understand mathematical formulation, okay? So it's like, um, I don't know. Um, if you write, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be writing this properly, but. Any Greek here? No? I think it's something like this. Um, and then I don't remember. Anyway, there, uh, if I write something in Greek, I was trying to write noste seuton, which means <coughs> know yourself in Greek, right? So one thing, you look at that. You can memorize it, but if you don't know what it means, why do you do it, right? That's why I didn't memorize it back then when I read about it. Anyway. You can also, maybe if you know how to read each one of the characters in Greek, you might be able to read it, but you still don't know the meaning, right? So I don't want you to read an equation as the derivative of x, t, square, blah, 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 plus. I don't want you to read it. The point is, what is the meaning of that formulation, right? So I want you to focus on interpreting the mathematical notation that we're using rather than just reading it aloud. If it doesn't mean anything to you, why, why do you look at it, right? So that's what I mean by, um, I just want to get rid of it before someone that knows what it, what it is. Gone. Anyway, so maths is not about calculating things, it's about understanding mathematical formulation, right? About understanding the, the meaning. So statistics is very important, and not because I want you to calculate the mean of something or the standard deviation. 
in data science, we need to have some statistical thinking, right? Statistical reasoning, okay? We need to be able to interpret things with statistical sense. Let me give you one example, and I think one of my students from the past will know the example. Say that you are a hospital manager. This is uh, the, the example that I always give you. You're, you're a hospital manager or you're a doctor, right? And this company comes to you and they say, well, three companies come to you. And they say, I have a great machine that can tell you if a patient is ill or healthy. And you don't believe them, right? You go, huh, let me try them first. So you get 100 patients. You know which one is healthy and which one is ill. So you show the patient to the machine. And the machine gives you the answer. And you compare the machine's answer with what you know the right diagnosis is. Right, so you do this for the three machines. The first machine, machine A, when after doing all the calculations, you realize that out of 100 patients, the machine A could only <coughs> guess whether could only identify two patients correctly. Could tell whether they were healthy or ill. The machine B, so we can say 2%, 25%. The machine B, 45% of the time, gives you the right answer. And the machine C, ninety percent of the time gives you the right answer. So you have started doing some experimentation. You assume that those machines are not perfect, right? And then you use some quantity to assess how good you, that machine is, right? So now, let's see red, blue, and yellow. Let's see if you give me the, which, which, answer, which one would you buy, right? So you have these three options. Which machine would you buy? The, the, the A, B, or C? And now you can use your cards. Everyone? Everyone. Right? OK? One, one of the, the reasons why I want you to use these cards is that you can see what others in the classroom are saying, right? And also, I think a very important lesson is that even though everyone might have the same answer, all of them, they can be wrong, right? So most of you are going to buy this machine, but a few of you want to buy this one. And the answer is why do we have those people that want to buy the machine that only gives you the right answer 2% of the time? Why? Right. So if I know that my machine is consistently giving me the right answer, what do I do? I buy that machine and I say the opposite, right? So if my machine says healthy, I say ill. If my machine says ill, I say healthy. And then by the price of this, I get a machine that 98% of the time gives me the right answer, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I did an experiment, right? I got 100 patients. But how do you write? How are you writing? I am always right. <laughs> what do you mean? I am. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So that, that's a that's a very good question because in, in when we are working with data, when we want to learn from data, we assume that we have our data correctly labeled, right? So in, in, in scientific uh, terminology, we talk about the gold standard, right? So the gold standard is something that we know or that, that we assume that is right. Okay, so that's our starting point. I agree with you that if I am a crappy doctor and 98% of the time I do the things the other way around, so that, that could happen, right? But the point here is not necessarily that, but if we have the right data, we have the data correctly labeled, right? What I want to bring about here is how we are interpreting these numbers here, right? It is very important that we can 
interpret those values correctly, right? Because we might be doing, we might be making the wrong decision here. I mean, obviously, this, this one looks much better than this one, but if we are a bit twisted, we go, actually, this is much better than this one. This is the worst one, right? Here, they wanted to sell me a coin, <laughs> right? So if I get a coin, right, I go, is this healthy? Heads, yes. Tails, <laughs> ill. So, quite expensive coin, right? So anyway, the, the whole point is that we are going to be using statistics to develop our thinking, right? So not necessarily Gaussian distribution, the mean and the standard deviation, not necessarily that. That's important, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, that's important. But here I want to emphasize how important it is to have uh, some statistical thinking, okay? Machine learning, of course, right? Machine learning actually overlaps with statistics a little, well, quite a lot, okay? So there are many techniques that some people play, they are machine learning techniques, but if you, if you come from a, from a statistical background, you will say, no, that's statistics, okay? And this, what this shows is that there have been two separate communities working on the same problems, reaching or pro providing the same solution and labeling the solution as machine learning if you belong to this community or statistics if you belong to the other one. Machine learning em emphasizes a little bit the fact that we are using computers, which are the machines, right? That's the, the idea. Now, image processing, signal processing, <coughs> There are techniques that we are going to use to extract features or extract attributes from signals and images which might be in our database. And I will talk about this later on. Obviously computing, we will be doing computation somewhere. Databases, we need to uh, have our data that we have recorded somewhere stored. Big data cloud emphasizes them, I mean, using cloud technologies to, um, to access the data online. Big data refers to the amount of data that we might have. So there are many techniques around. Uh, you need to understand what they are, but you don't need to be obviously an expert in each one of them. You might be an expert in image processing or in databases or whatever, right? But you need to understand the role of each one of these technologies. Right, so I think you're familiar with this diagram, right? So we have, first of all, the stage at the top is what we think is data science. The deployment at the bottom is another department within your company, right? But we are going to create, so uh, we are going to extract knowledge by implementing some kind of learning. So let's go and let's, let's open this box here, okay? And remember, I was, I was talking to one of your classmates and um, you might have watched some online course on machine learning and so on. And there they say, oh, if you don't understand the details of this, don't worry. This, you need to worry. Because this is your job, right? It's like if you're a doctor and they tell you, don't worry about where the stomach is. It's fine, don't worry. <laughs> you have to worry, it's your job if you want to be a doctor, right? If, you, if someone tells you, oh, don't worry about that box there, you just download a library and it does it for you. Well, you are the ones here that are concerned with, with that box, so you need to understand how it looks like, right? So let's open it. Well, let's open the, the whole process there, the whole pipeline in, in data science. So usually, this scheme, you will see many similar schemes around, but they are more or less, they will be more or less similar. This is the the methodology that we should use. And here everything is sort of linear, but in reality you know that we go two steps forward, one backwards, another three backwards, and then forward, and so on, right? So it's not necessarily as linear as I presented here. But in general, in any data science problem, right, if we look at the whole problem, we start formulating the problem, right? This is how things should be done, right? So we formulate the problem. Once we formulate the problem, we decide which data to collect, okay? After collect collecting the data, we have a look at it, okay? We explore our data, right? There are many people that jump from data collection to model training, for instance, right? 
but that's not the right way of doing things. You need to understand your data. Okay, again, you need to know where the stomach is if you are a doctor. If you are going to analyze data, you need to explore it first. So once you explore it, you will most likely extract some features, right? So there you have this raw data. Raw data is the data that you have collected, right? So based on your raw data, on your data set, you're going to extract some features. And you are going to create, essentially, a collection of items with some attributes, okay? So imagine that I want to distinguish um, I, a, a car from a motorbike, right? So I, I, I'm asking myself, how can I distinguish a car from a motorbike? So I get 100 cars and I extract features, length, height, color, right? So I have 100 instances and I have several attributes for each one of the instances. That would be the data set that I'm going to fit my uh, data science uh, technique, right? So once we have created this data set, we follow this process of model training, model testing, and model optimization. Okay, training, testing, and optimization. And we will see what we mean by that in a few slides, right? For the time being, just, I mean, for data mining, the usual uh, scenario is that we haven't formulated a problem before collecting data. What usually happens is that you have data, this is what we sell the companies. We say, you have a lot of data already. Give it to me, and I will analyze it for you. If we were being very scientific, we would first say, okay, what is my problem? Right, which data should I get? Right, let's explore it. But what we will see is that we have already data. Okay, so we are going to formulate the problem after we have collected the data. Okay, so things might change a little bit. But this is a general diagram. So we are mostly going to be concerned with data exploration, feature extraction, and then the last box at the bottom is like model uh, generation, right? So at the bottom we will generate our model. Right, so what is a model? That's the question. That this is, our knowledge is here, it's summarized in a model, right? So the model essentially is a system. And most of you will be familiar with this concept, but let's go through it. So essentially a model is a system that has an input and produces an output, okay? In data mining, in data science, we will use for the input of the model, we will most of the time use the term uh, features, for instance. Obviously, from a mathematical point of view, that's an independent variable. We will also call it a predictor, right? So whatever feeds our model is going to, call, to be called predictor, uh, independent variable, input, and so on. The output is going to be the response that our model produces, so it's going to be the out out output variable, okay? So these terms here is for you to just get used to them, right? So tonight when you go to bed, you say response, uh, input, and so on. You repeat it a few times and then you will get used to them, okay? So they're just words for, for this, okay? So usually our data set, remember our data set is a collection of instances and each one of the instances has a set of attributes, right? So those attributes for each instance, those attributes we are going to use with, with our model, right? So for instance, if I want to um, predict, um, no, let me think of a, of a problem. If I have a picture and I want to see, I want to say, well, in this picture there is a cat or there is a dog, my data set might be the picture of the dog and then a label saying dog, right? So my model is going to get as an input the picture and output the word dog, right? So we can see here that two attributes of the data set that I have created, which is picture and the word dog or cat, which is a label, we are going to be using them to create our model. And, and you will understand better uh, later on how we are going to be using uh, this. Right, so those attributes that we were discussing, right? So uh, each one of our instances has a series of attributes. 
those attributes are going to be numbers at the end of the day, okay? So we have different types of variables that we are going to be playing with and it's very important to, important to distinguish them. We have what we call continuous values, right? Like the real numbers, that's continuous. We also have discrete values. We have ordinal values which are discrete but admit an order. And then based on them, we can create a little bit more complex variables by, uh, for instance, if, if I take continuous values and I create um, a sequence of them, that's what we call a signal, right? That could be an attribute. So another attribute could be a sequence of numbers, right? If we have an array that can be a picture, right? That's also an attribute, right? So our attributes are going to be either one number, which can be continuous or discrete, or a bunch of numbers arranged as a vector or arranged as an image, or as an array, right? A signal and an image. Those are attributes. Now, why are we saying there that ordering and distance are defined or not defined and so on? For the example here, the machines that, I, that they were trying to sell me had two outputs, right? Which was healthy or ill. That's we're talking about a discrete variable, right? Zero, one, okay? Now, uh, how did I assess the quality of the machine? By comparing the output of the machine with, the, with my output, right? I compare them both, okay? So the quality, which is this number here, is calculated based on whether the output the machine's output and my output were the same or different, right? So in general, this notion of distance or equality, those notions we are going to use to create a function that tells us how good our machine is. That's why we mention it here, okay? So if I want to predict where my car is going to be after three seconds, my prediction is going to be very, very good if, if my car it's going to be very close to my estimation. Okay, so the notion of distance tells me how good my prediction was. If I predict that the car is going to be there and the car is here, the distance is huge, so my predictor is very bad. Okay, so the notion of distance and equality will help us create this function that tells us how good or how bad my solution is, right? Obviously, you, you know most of this, but it's, it's a, a little bit of a review. Right, so here we go back to this previous slide, and in this case, the job for you is to try to identify what the input is, input is the output, and the, the types, right? So if we go, for instance, to the flight prices uh, example. So you have a machine, an algorithm that tells you what the price is going to be today based on the prices yesterday. So essentially, if, 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 if many people want to buy a ticket, so I increase the price to make more money, right? So based on the prices yesterday, I predict the, the price today, right? So the price, in principle, is a continuous variable. So the input is going to be the price yesterday, and the output, the prediction, is going to be the price today. Both of them continuous variables. Uh, for the search engine, the search term is going to be a sequence of characters, right? A vector of characters. That's the input. And the output is going to be advert. That could be a number identifying which advert I'm going to display, right? So all of those things there, all of those um, inputs and outputs in this example, they can be uh, codified by using variables, continuous, discrete, arrays, vectors and so on. <coughs> right, another comment about models and mathematics computers. Um, when we talk about models, we sometimes we will be talking about a mathematical model and some of the times we will be talking about a computer model. Again, a mathematical model, don't get, don't be scared about it, okay? We just want to understand what it means, whichever mathematical expression we are using, okay? When we talk about computers mo computer models, we're talking about an implementation, a software, a piece of program that performs some calculations, right? So you feed the program some data and the 
program gives you some output. Okay? Both models are, we are going, they're going to be equivalent. From our point, right? So every mathematical model, you will be able to turn into a program. Okay? And every program will have an associated mathematical model. Right? So in general, we are going to talk about model, models, but I think it's, a bit, it's healthy to remember that sometimes this model will be a mathematical expression, sometimes it's going to be a computer program, but they are the same thing. If you come from computer science, your model is most likely going to be a computer model. If you have a mathematical background, you will be thinking in terms of mathematical models, but they are the same thing, okay? So for every mathematical model that we see, there's going to be a numerical implementation somewhere and vice versa, okay? Right. How tired are you? You can talk it for 20 minutes. It is also useful to make a distinction between parametric and non-parametric models. I don't know if you are familiar with these two terms, but I want to get them, uh, I, I want to get them uh, sorted now early on. So we said that a, a model might be a mathematical expression, right? So let's think what about what we do in data science. In data science, we get data and we produce a model, okay? The question is which model, right? Or how do we produce this model? If we follow a parametric approach, essentially we are assuming that the model that we are generating, okay? That model uh, belongs to a certain type of model. So, so you're not exploring every single possibility, but you assume that it's just one type of model. For instance, imagine that I want to, um, I want to describe the, the, your height or the height of this classroom, right? What I'm going to assume is that for describing it, what, what I mean to say is which percentage of the classroom is taller than 1.7, well, well here you use feet for, for foot, so I don't know how to use them, right? Four feet is that, no, no, I want it to be. Four, five, six, seven, and so on. So essentially we want to describe which percentage of the classroom is this little, this little, and so on, okay? The, the reasonable thing to do here is to assume that the height is distributed following a Gaussian distribution, right? So we are going to have something like this. Okay, that's a more or less a Gaussian distribution. But there are many Gaussian distributions and the difference is the mean and the standard deviation, right? So as a data scientist, I want to produce a model. I have chosen the type of model, the type, but I haven't produced the actual model. So what do I do? I get the height in the classroom, I calculate the mean and the standard deviation, right? So those two numbers, they tell me that the mean is 1.68. Right, that's the mean, and oops, this is meters, not foot. And the standard deviation is going to be, I don't know, 20 centimeters, something like that. So once I choose these two numbers, I have produced the model, right? So this is an example of a parametric approach. Why is it parametric? Because I have chosen one type of model, in this case, the Gaussian distribution. And how do I create the actual model? By choosing the values of these two parameters, right? So once I say this is 1.68 and this is 0 0.2, I have created the model. So this is a parametric approach. I didn't say that the distribution was other thing other than Gaussian, right? But once I choose Gaussian, what I need to do is I need to find the values for the mean and the standard deviation, I have the model. I could have taken a different approach and I could have created a histogram, right? So I create a histogram and I represent the heights. I haven't assumed anything about the shape. I don't know if that, you can see that from, from there, up there. But anyway, I haven't assumed anything about the shape of the distribution, right? This is a non-parametric approach. So how do I create my model? By, essentially, determining how tall each one of those rectangles are. I use my data in one case to calculate these two parameters 
in the other case to uh, determine the height of each one of these, these uh, rectangles, okay? So this is a non-parametric approach, and this is a parametric approach. Both of them are models. This is a parametric approach, which means that I have assumed that the shape is Gaussian. This is a non-parametric approach because I haven't made any assumption whatsoever about the shape, okay? Right. So how do we use data? This is what we, you need to think, right? To set these values and to uh, identify the other values. The difference is that, obviously, this is more flexible than this one, right? If we say that it's Gaussian, it's going to be Gaussian. It's not going to give me any other, any other shape. But here, I only need to calculate two numbers. This is much easier than a non-parametric approach. But the non-parametric approach, obviously, could produce other shapes which are closer than the, to the reality than, than the parametric ones. Okay? Right. Now, in case you're a bit lost, let me go a few slides back to this diagram here. Okay? So this is the textbook pipeline. And I said that most likely you're not going to be doing exactly each one of the steps in the order that I'm showing you here, okay? But what I want to remind you again is that once we have explored our data and so on, once we have extracted some features, then we have to create the model. And we create the model by following those three steps. The last one, model optimization, we're not going to talk too much about it because, I mean, it's sort of saying, okay, I have several options, this is the best one, this is model optimization. Let's forget about the last stage. But let's talk about training and testing, which is very important to uh, understand the distinction between those two phases. And remember, sorry, to go back here. The input, so to speak, to this stage is a data set consisting of instances with attributes. Okay, remember that. So what do we mean by model training? Okay, what, what's model training? So we want to use our data, okay, to build a model. Remember that if we don't do that, we might have a model, but that's not a data-driven approach. We are going to be talking about data-driven approaches as those approaches that generate models using data, okay? That doesn't mean that that's always going to be the best way of doing things, right? But if we want to generate a model first, we get the data and based on the data, we use some techniques and then we say this is the model, okay? However, how do we know that this model that we have generated is a good model, okay? How do we know it? I think the, the best, um, example I can give you is you studying for an exam, okay? Say you come to data mining, I give you 10 exercises, we solve them in the classroom, and you go back home and you solve the 10 problems, then we go to the exam, and I give you one of those problems, okay? And all of you, you get them, you, you, you give me the right answer for, for the problem that I gave you, right? How do I know that you have learned? So no, because you, you could have memorized the solution, right? So if I give you, in the exam, the same problem that we solved in the classroom, okay, so I've given you 10 problems, you have memorized the solutions, then you come to the exam and you just give me the solution that you have memorized. Do I know that you have learned? I don't. How can I test you? I need to give you a different problem, right? I mean, if I give you the same problem and you can't solve it, I can tell that you haven't learned. That I know, but if you give me the right answer, I don't know whether you have just memorized it, right? So I need to test your ability to generalize. I mean, learning is not memorizing, right? Learning is being able to use what you have been studying and apply it to a situation that you, have, you haven't been exposed to, right? So. Uh, in data science, we follow the same idea. And we have two stages, model training 
and module testing. So I use the data, in this case you can imagine 10 problems that we have solved in the classroom, so you have the problem, you have the solution, right? So I'll give you this data, and then I test with a different set of data. So those, the, the data set that we are using for generating a model, we are always going to split it into at least two subsets. The training data set and the test data set. So usually we get 70% of our data set, we are going to use it for training. It's like giving you 70 problems and we solve them in the classroom. And then 30% of the data set, which you haven't seen, I'm going to use for testing. What we want to avoid is what we call overfitting. Okay? So overfitting is a situation where your model memorizes the examples that I had given the model, right? If, say that, um, let me give you one example here. have a data set which I'm going to represent as a table first okay so I have two attributes X and Y okay so this is my first instance second third fourth and so on so I have a collection of instances right and here I have the values for X and Y this is a representation okay so we could have for instance one two three four five, six, seven, right? And here I have 1.2, 1 1.7, 3.3, 3 4.1, 4.7, and so on, okay? So this is my data set. It can mean, I don't know what, it can, could mean anything, right? Remember that once we build a data set, we just have a bunch of numbers. It don't mean anything, right? I can also plot it, okay? So I have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is X, this is Y. This is a, an alternative way of representing my data, right? So I can represent it as, as points in a plane. So I have 1.2 is more or less here, and this one is here, and so on, right? So I have a number of points. Okay? And imagine that I want to learn the relationship between these two variables, okay? So imagine that I ask myself, if x is 1.5, what's y going to be, right? So x, I'm going to use it as the input for my model, y is going to be the output, right? So I might ask, we create a model, right? So we are here, the, the question is, what is the value of x? That's what we want to answer. So we create a model, and there are many different models, right? This is one possibility. That's one model, why not, right? Another possibility would be straight line like this. Okay? Another possibility could be something like this. Okay, I have there three models. Which one would you choose, right? Let's, let's try to do, so this curve here is going to be blue. The straight line is going to be red, and this one is going to be yellow. Which one would you use, would you choose? Which one? So most of you go for the straight line. Why? Why? Huh? It's like a medium. <laughs> Sorry? It's not complicated. Generalize it. But you can memorize it, and that's not a problem, right? Yeah, but but that's we are we are not in this case. We are just as you say, we are memorizing that. We are producing. A We have it as data, right? Standard deviation of what?
You mean the distance of from these ones and the, yeah. from your data? Okay, the, the, the main point here is that in principle, it, any solution would be valid until we have uh, new data, exactly, but before saying which one is the best, we have to agree on something. We have to agree on what we mean by a good solution, right? So all of you that have chosen a specific solution, in your minds, you had a way of quantifying the quality of your solution, right? So many times we have problems when there are two people, they have an, a different idea of what, it, what is good and what's bad, and they will never agree. They will never agree because firstly, you need to agree what a good solution is, right? So here, most of you are telling me that this is good because on average, the error that I'm making here, right, seems to be the smallest. We have a, here again the notion, remember I was talking about the notion of distance, right? So here the distance between my point and my solution is small, right? You accept that there's going to be some error. So you don't mind. What you want to do is you want to minimize the error, right? So you have a criterion for quality. So in every single data science problem, in addition to formulating your goal, you need to identify what you mean by a good solution because you will, you will want to rank them, right? The best solution, second best, third best. Earlier, what did you, we use when we were talking about these machines that tell you which patient is ill or blah, blah? And we were using the percentage of right answers, right? That's what we initially used. And then we changed our minds, right? So remember, we had the figures 2%, 45%, and 90%. This number was the number that was telling you how good the machine is. And obviously, if you take this number as the quality of your machine, this is the best one. But then we thought, actually, the definition of quality that I had in mind was wrong, because this one, I can, if I change it and I do the opposite, I get 98%, right? So the definition of quality that we start using was not quite right. It was one option, but we realized that just looking at this number, and ranking them according to, this num according to this number was not the right way of doing things, right? So here is the same, okay? So another, uh, uh, one of your classmates said, okay, but this is working fine for my training data. But I want to expose, or I want to test my model by using data that we haven't used before, right? And that's when the test stage comes Right, so first of all, we use training data, we produce a model, and then we test the model, right? So for the testing stage, we use data that our machine has not been exposed to before, okay? So our data set is going to be always training and testing. And we want to do this to avoid uh, the case where uh, we memorize, right? Like here, we are memorizing it's this machine here memorizing my examples, right? So we don't want to quantify the quality of my machine based on those examples that we have used for training. We want to give them new samples. And then we want to calculate that error that we made, right? In other words, if these machines have been built by using some patients, and then I use the same patients to check how good they are, most likely I would get 100%, 100%, 100%. Or I might get that, right? Because those machines might be very good uh, for classifying those patients that, that they have already seen. That's why I, I, I brought 100 new patients. Okay, so that's why we want to use different data sets for training and for um, testing, okay? And here, for instance, these numbers here, I calculated them by using data which is training data, and here is the same. Okay, do you understand this difference? Okay, the, the crucial words are generalizing, which means you learn this, and then you use it, you generalize what you have learned by exploring new problems. And overfitting means memorizing. Okay, so overfitting, bad, right? 
memorizing, but okay. Right, any question? I'm going to walk around. You can talk to each other for two minutes if you want to. But if you have any question, anyone? Everything clear? Yeah, questions? Yes. Sorry? No, no, no. I'm sorry. No. Yes. <laughs> any question? We haven't finished. Any question? Questions? Nothing? No phones. Go away. No phones? Yes. Uh, I might have some. Yeah, they are the least popular ones. But I'll look. Any question? Nothing at all? Pen and paper, no phones. Pen and paper, no phones. Your classmate. Do you have some extra pen and paper for him? Yeah. Any question? Yeah. At the end of the day, we will do some calculation with the data, right? So everything will have to be a number. Yeah. A any data you can think of will be expressed as uh, bits, if you will, zeros and ones, anything. My voice, an image. Exactly, good. Or well, you can represent it as a vector or... Yeah, the question is whether you can order them or not, right? In the case of good, medium or bad, you can have zero, one and two, right? So there is some ordering. In some of the cases, like A, B, like if you... Exactly, you need, to, you need to understand how you are representing your data because that will make you use one technique or another, right? So the type of data that you're using, we're going to see a little bit more about the different algorithms for different types of data in the minute, okay? I'll, I'll come back to you, yeah. Right. Um, So uh, I didn't notice it, but it's almost uh, five, right? So am I allowed to go very quickly through the next few slides and next week we will review them again, but let me just go through them very quickly and then we finish. Is that right with you? Yeah. Ready? <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway, but I had to, I had to pretend that I'm listening to you. Okay. Right. So the, uh, some final words about uh, the different types of uh, techniques that we are going to be using. This is when we talk about our taxonomy, we essentially we are classifying different tex techniques, right, in different groups. And this is very useful for you because essentially your data science problem is going to be a classification problem or a regression problem and so on, right? So classification problems will have a set of techniques, regression problems, another set of techniques and so on. So you need to be able to distinguish them. And the distinction is very, might be a little bit awkward now for you, but you will see that, you will learn it very, very quickly, okay? So uh, the first distinction that we make is between supervised and unsupervised learning, right? And remember, learning is creating a model, okay? So when we talk about supervised learning, we are talking about a data set, okay, which, gives us both the input and the desired output of our model, right? So uh, if you have that data, you talk about supervised data. Unsupervised data, or unsupervised, sorry, learning, in unsupervised learning, your data is not labeled, right? So an example of supervised data is a collection of pictures and a label describing the picture. And you want to predict the label that's supervised. You have the solution. Picture solution is this, right? So if your data has both the input and output for your model, we are going to be in a supervised environment, 
and otherwise it's going to be unsupervised. <coughs> then within the family of supervised techniques, we have two different types of problems, which is classification and regression. And the distinction is very simple. In a classification problem, the output is going to be a discrete value, right? Like dog and cat, black and white. One, five, ten. It has to be discrete value. However, in regression, this, is, this was a regression problem here. In a regression problem, the output can be any value here, any continuous value. This one was a classification problem. We are classifying the patients as ill or healthy. Regression, we can give any continuous value there. Okay, very simple dis uh, um, distinction. Next, next week, we are going to start with regression, by the way. Then in unsupervised, we have what we, two types of techniques. That we have many more, but these are the main ones. We have what we call clustering, and we have dimensionality reduction, okay? So these techniques, they are used to summarize data. Clustering essentially takes a collection of instances, right, the data set, and produces groups, classes, clusters, for collections of instances, right? So by using these techniques, we can summarize, instead of having a huge data set with 200 instances, we have a smaller one with smaller clusters, right? And then dimensionality reduction aims at simplifying the attributes, okay? Imagine, remember the example I gave you. How can I distinguish a car from a motorcycle, right? So I create a huge data set with uh, all the many, many features, right? Now these features are, some of them are irrelevant, some others are redundant. At the end of the day, how do I distinguish a car from a motorcycle? If it has four wheels, it's a car. If it has two, assuming that they are either one or the other, right? Assuming that I have something with a motorcycle or with a, a car, but I just look at the number of wheels and that's it. So all the other features, I don't need them. Right? There are many other cases where we can perform what we call dimensionality reduction by uh, looking at redundancy between features. Right? So two features might be correlated, which means that one can predict the other. So uh, we don't need to use them both. Okay? Right. Should we just see without? I mean, I went very quickly through these last few slides. So let's see whether we have understood what we have said. We have four minutes, one minute per slide. So in this, in this slide, my aim is to, you already read many of you, you see that, that map of Britain, right? We have different regions, sort of clusters, right? And uh, my goal is to predict how much the house prices are going to increase right, in each one of those regions, okay? So what kind of data science problem do I have here? Classification, regression, or clustering? Red, 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 blue. Yeah, okay, so it's, I have used the, the word cluster just to, to see whether I, I would make you a little bit confused. So it's not a clustering problem, right? It's a regression problem because I want to estimate a value which is continuous. It can be 1, 1 1.5, 1.6, and so on. So it's a regression problem. Right? For each one of the regions, I want to guess a continuous value. Right? So this is going to be a regression problem. What about here? This is simple, right? So I have a picture, and I want to know whether it's dog or not. So what is this? It's classification, right? Very simple. The next one, you compare these two pictures. Okay? Can you see a dog in both of them? Yeah? Okay. So in this case, we want to, we, we start with a collection of pictures and then we obtain a new picture. Right? But we, we want the picture to be, in this case, um, simpler, right? But, or less, smaller in terms of size, 
but we want it to represent the same information. What have we done here? Dimensionality reduction, regression, or clustering? Dimensionality reduction because we are eliminating redundancy, right? This picture here was admittedly more accurate, but there was a lot of redundancy. We didn't need all the pictures in this picture. We can, um, we can have a, a simpler image, a smaller image with the same information. That's dimensionality reduction. And finally, Clustering, okay. <laughs> anyway, you can read it, the, the solution is, is clustering, right? So here we have a lot of data, but we have created three different clusters. So that's the, the last technique, clustering, okay? So I'm going to see some of you on Monday, some others on Friday. Have a good weekend, and see you later.